Good morning, Booktube. This is Johnny. I'm sitting here on a Sunday morning. It is uh, sunny outside. Once again, I say to myself, I should go out for a walk. I can't remember the last time I went for a walk. And uh, I did mow the lawn yesterday. Rake leaves. So, so today is a Sunday. It is October the 14th here in West Michigan. It is 10.56 late Sunday morning reading the Bible. I was looking at the Beatitudes and um, because I was there in the Gospel of Matthew, I think. And let me see here. Yeah, Matthew chapter 5. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain and when he was seated in his, and his disciples came to him, then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who persecute, those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and exceedingly be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. But that verse there, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And uh, when I was reading this, this book this morning, I've been reading this for months, Seeing God, Pacific Vision and Christian Tradition by Hans Borsma. He uh, quoted from this book that I have in my library. It's called The Beatitudes by Thomas Watson. Thomas Watson was another English, 17th century English Puritan. And this, his exposition of Matthew 5, uh, verses 1 through 12 on the Beatitudes. And I was reading him, uh, where he quotes here on what seeing God is. So I was kind of just reading that this morning. And what it means, be, be, uh, like he says here, uh, this is chapter 17, the blessed privilege of seeing God explained, they shall see God. Matthew 5, 8, the sight of God in this life and the life to come. And then he has here, Nine Excellencies of the Pacific Vision. He says here, I'll just read a little bit here. Our sight of God in heaven shall be a transparent light. Here we see him through a glass darkly. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 12. But through Christ we shall behold God in a very illustrious manner. God will unveil himself and show forth his glory so far as his soul is capable to receive. If Adam had not sinned, yet it is probable he should never had, have had such a clear sight of God as the saints in glory shall have. We shall see him as he is, 1 John 3, verse 2. Now we see him as he is not. He is not mutable, not mortal. There we shall see him as he is, in a very transparent manner. Then shall I know, even also am I known, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. That is, clearly, does not God know us clearly and fully? Then shall the saints know him, according to their capacity, as they are known. As their love of God, so their sight of God shall be perfect. Two, this sight of God will be a transcendent sight. It will surpass in glory. 
such, such glittering beams shall sparkle forth from the Lord Jesus as shall infinitely amaze and delight the, saint, delight the eyes of the beholders. Imagine what a blessed sight it would be to see Christ wearing the, wearing the robe of our human nature and see the nature sitting in glory above the angels. If God be such excellency in him when we see him by the eye of faith, through the perspective glass of a promise, oh, what will it be when we shall see him face to face? When Christ was transfigured on the mount, he was full of glory. Matthew 17, verse 2. If, it is in trans if, it, if his transfiguration were so glorious, what will be his inauguration be? What a glorious time will it be when, as it was said of Mordecai, we shall see him in the presence of his father, arrayed in royal apparel and with great crown of gold upon his head. Esther 8, verse 15. There will be glory beyond hyperpole. If the sun were 10,000 times brighter than it is, it cannot so much as shadow out this glory. In the heavenly horizon, we behold beauty in its first magnitude and highest elevation. There we shall see the king in his glory. Isaiah 33, verse 17. All lights are but eclipses compared with that glorious vision. Three, this sight of God will be a transforming light. We shall be like him. 1 John 3, verse 2. The saints shall be changed into glory. As when this light springs into a dark room, the room may be said to be changed from what it was. The saints shall know, so see God as to be changed into his image. Psalm 17, verse 15. Here God's people are blackened and sullied with infirmities, but in heaven they shall, shall be as the doves covered with silver wings. They shall have some rays and beams of God's glory shining in them. As a man that rolls himself in the snow is of snow-like whiteness, so the crystal, by having the sun shine on it, sparkles and looks like the sun. So the saints, by beholding the brightness of God's glory, shall have a tixner of that glory upon them. Not that they shall partake of God's very essence, for the iron in the fire becomes fire, yet remains iron still. So the saints, by beholding the luster of God's majesty, shall be a glorious creatures, but yet creatures still. For this sight of God will be a joyful sight. They shall make me glad with the light of thy countenance. Thou shalt make me glad with the light of thy countenance. Acts 2 verse 28. After a sharp winter, how pleasant would be to see the sun of righteousness displaying himself in all his glory. Does faith breed joy? In whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable? 1 Peter 1 verse 8. If the joy of, of faith be such, what would be the joy of vision be? The sight of Christ will amaze the eye with wonder and ravish the heart with joy. If the face of a friend whom we entirely loved so affects us and drives away sorrow, Oh, how cheering will the sight of God be to the saints in heaven. And then indeed it may be said, your heart shall rejoice. John 16, verse 22. And then he goes on. I just thought I'd just read a little bit. This is from Thomas Watson, the Beatitudes. He's talking about there, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So I was reading that. Also, John Owen goes into this seeing God here. Uh, he quotes um, Borsma also quotes John Owen here on the glory of uh, John Owen on the beauty of God set forth in Christ. He quotes John Owen, so I got that out, the glory of Christ. He was another 17th century English Puritan. Just wonderful material. And, uh, yeah, the difference between the faith and sight of it and the glory of Christ. Uh, like he says here, the more we grow in faith and spiritual light, the more sensible are we of our present burdens and the more vehemently we groan for deliverance of the perfect liberty of the sons of God. 
This is the posture of their minds who have received the first fruits of the Spirit in the most imminent degree. The nearer anyone is to heaven, the more earnestly de he desires to be there, because Christ is there. For the more frequent and steady are our views of him by faith, the more do we long and groan for the removal of all obstructions and interpositions in our so doing. Now groaning is the expression of a vehement desire mixed with sorrow for the present want of what is desired. The desire has sorrow, and that sorrow has joy and refreshment in it, like a shower that falls on a man in a garden in the spring. It wets him, but withal refresheth him with savor. It causeth the flowers and herbs of the garden where he is. In this groaning, which it is constant and habitual, is one of the choicest effects of faith in this life, respects what we should be delivered from and what we would obtain unto. The first is expressed in Romans 7, verse 24. In other places now mentioned, and in this frame, with the intermixture of some sighs from weariness, by trouble, sorrows, pain, sickness of this life, is the best we can appear to, unto. At last, we cannot here think of Christ, but we are quickly ashamed of and troubled at our own thoughts and so confused as they are so unsteady and so unperfectly. Commonly they issue in a groan or a sigh. Oh, when we shall come into him, then we shall be ever with him. We shall see him as he is. And at any time he begins to give more than ordinary evidences and imitations of his glory and love unto our souls, we are not able to bear them so as to give them any abiding residence in our minds. But ordinarily this trouble and groaning is amongst our best attainments in this world, a trouble which I pray, God, I never be delivered from until deliverance do come at once from this state of mortality. Yea, the Lord, the good Lord increases this trouble the more and more in all that believe. The heart of a believer affected with the glory of Christ is like the needle touched with lodestone. It can no longer be quiet, no longer be satisfied with, in a distance from him. It is put in a continual motion towards him. This motion indeed is weak and tremulous, panting and breathing and sighing and growing in prayer and meditations in secret recesses of our minds are the life of it. However, it is continually pressing toward him but it tames not its point. It comes not to its center and rest in this world. But now above, all things are clear and serene, all plain and evident in our beholding the glory of Christ. We shall ever be with him and see him as he is. This is heaven. This is blessedness. This is eternal rest. John Owen and the glory of Christ. Behold. So yeah, it's like a Christian as he's in this world, he pants, he sighs, he groans, he longs for that time when he'll behold perfectly the glory of Christ in heaven. So I was reading that this morning, Seeing God, Pacific Vision and Christian Tradition by Hans Moore Borsma, reading John Owen, The Glory of Christ, reading Thomas Watson on the Beatitudes. For my morning devotions, uh, it's going on, it's 11.09 here in Southwest Michigan. Writing in my diary, I'm on page 844. So that's it. Today is Sunday. So uh, I just thought I'd share what I'm reading in the morning for devotions. I did make a video last night, I think. I can't remember what I did last night. I can't remember. But I just thought I'd just stop by and say hello, hoping you're having a good day. Uh, I might make a video maybe tomorrow. So I'll sign off. Thank you for the comments. Thank you for the new subscribers. Hope you're doing well. And uh, yeah, check out Thomas Watson, The Beatitudes. Check out John Owen on The Glory of Christ. Uh, I'm really enjoying, I've really enjoyed reading Seeing God, The Beatific Vision of Christian T Tradition by Hans Porzma. I still, I do have The Puritan Piety, 
writings in honor of Joel R. Beakey by Michael A. D. Hayden and Paul M. Smalley. I'm reading the one here this morning on the kingdom of God and the theology of Jonathan Edwards by Paul M. Smalley. Reading Michael Allen, Grounded in Heaven, Recentering Christian Hope and the Life on God. And reading uh, Isaac Ambrose, Looking Unto Jesus. So that is my Christian Sabbath reading. Uh, can't go wrong with these books if you want some good Christian literature, something to read as you, as we go through the wasteland, marching up to Zion, preparing ourselves for the eternal state. So I'll sign off until next time. Bye.